as he said, uh, used to be a minister, that used to be me, before I saw the light of reason. Um, and it's been very interesting, uh, he started talking about church, and I thought, okay, it's always talking about church before I get up. For those that don't know, the Brother Richard thing is a joke that has gone terribly, terrible and just won't leave me alone. Uh, but people usually say it in love and that's fine, but then people think I'm trying to. Well, now people are actually making atheist churches, but they tried to accuse me of doing that. And I used to joke that in this church of atheism, you only have to tithe 6.66%. <laughs> so we have them beat. But anyway, from my unique perspective that I went on, and what Andy talked about today, uh, about the placebo effect is such a incredible truism in the sense that's the way I was. I, I was raised a heathen, loved Carl Sagan, I was an atheist, couldn't stand church. I mean, I was extreme as a kid. But I have a very messed up family. I, I ran away from home, and when you run away, you can't ever get a sandwich without somebody telling you about Jesus. So I, I created a little God box and was born again. And it literally did change my life. I had a physical change. It was tremendous. And Andy's book, and what he talked about today, but uh, why we believe in gods, if you don't have it, it's a little small book, it is incredible to explain a lot of that. Um, couldn't recommend it more. But from the perspective I come from, my rose-colored stained glasses, I guess, um, I, I kind of look at things differently in our world and think, OK, how can I take the things that I learned from the past and apply them in the atheist world. Uh, over the last decade, we're almost now at 10 years when the first book started coming out. Uh, Sam Harris, 2004, I think was the first one, and then of course we know the Dawkins and Hitchens and on all these great books. And if the statistics are true, millions of people are buying these books, and millions of people are saying, yeah, I, that kind of makes sense. I'm not really religious anyway, so I don't believe God. But where are they? They're not joining our organizations. Why is that? There, there is a whole other talk involved in that that I try to do, and hopefully we can help bridge the gap, should I speak, between the newer atheists and, and the atheist establishment and help it be a, a little more cohesive for us. Um, like I said, our strategies need to update. Uh, some of the things we do might be right, but they're not necessarily effective. When we get on talk shows, we have the right answers, and we win the intellectual fight, but we haven't learned the sound bites yet, like that our religious opponents will do. Uh, it's starting to change a little bit, but we'll sit with someone like uh, Bill Donahue, who'll, he'll just belittle atheism and say all this stuff, and we should just stop and say, that's a bigoted statement, I demand you to apologize, and just do the games that they play, and learn the little, the wording of things. Like we were talking about evolution earlier and, and the different ways to approach it. I don't know if you notice, a lot of the news people will use the term, they want to say Darwinism instead because that associates with social Darwinism and you know Nazis and all this stuff. And that's the game they play. And what I try to do in the interviews I do, and interestingly, I have a larger Christian following still than I do atheists, which is for some reason. Um, but what I try to do, like when we talk about evolution, it's wrong when we play that game. First of all, when we get into the Darwin game. But when we say the theory of evolution, there is no theory of evolution. The fact that life has gone from simpler to more complex, for the most part, over millions of years, is the fact. We know that to be true. It's evolution. The theory is natural selection, evolution by means of natural selection. And I think if we, just a little thing like that when we're talking to people, it, it does help a lot. Uh, but so, like I said, our strategies aren't working. We know, and everyone's seen these. Uh, you know, 50, the new one just came out. That 50% of Americans find atheism threatening, and the old one, how we're distrusted as much as rapists. Uh, it, it's amazing if uh, the one that came out right after September 11th and all that happened had Muslims were higher up than us, and they got a little bit of bad press that day. <laughs> but they're still better off than us, so so something's not working. Um, and when it all comes down to it, it's about our friends and family, how do we deal with it, how do we take these great things we learned today and apply it to our real life. You know, how do we, when everyone's going, you know, at Thanksgiving and you're sitting around, how, how are you going to talk about evolution if you have believers, all that's, well, that's probably not the right picture for people like us, let me make it a little more effective there. <laughs> um, what do we do, how do we approach things? Uh, my family, it's funny, I was the first one to become a Christian, 
and I led all of them to the Lord, and now I'm an atheist, and so I'm the outcast. <laughs> <laughs> the first time we came out to our, well, we weren't we plan on coming out, but when we came out to my wife's family, uh, my daughter, youngest, was like, I think she was like five at the time, maybe, and we were gathering around Thanksgiving, and they wanted to pray, and we're just standing there. She goes, I want to do it, I want to do it. I'm like, oh crap, what is she doing? And she's like, dear tooth fairy. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody looked, and she was the same thing. <laughs> so that made for interesting dinner conversation. I was pretty proud of her, though. I got it. <laughs> anyway, so how do we deal with the friends and family? How do we do? That's why on this one particular issue, I, and when I'm dealing with believers, I try to say, above all else, Christians should thank God that America is a secular nation and try to use their own logic and their own talking and stuff of, of how to realize and how to come about looking at it our way. Because, again, that's another fight we do wrong when we say, we want, in God we trust, taking off money. No, how about we word it, we want to restore our national motto. We want to restore the Pledge of Allegiance, not get it off there. It's a whole different argument when you frame it that way. Uh, anyone know what the first model on currency was? Well, no, that, that's actually not. The very first, it was on a coin, and Benjamin Franklin came out with it. It was mind your business, which I think is awesome. <laughs> All right, there's a perception deception out there. Everyone thinks, this is what everyone thinks what we are doing. <laughs> Jesus and Darwin going at it again. <laughs> but we can help them realize we're all on the same boat. We're all, as Americans, and I'm specifically speaking as an American about American uh, government and stuff. Uh, so, I mean, that's my goal. You know, uh, the misunderstanding of secular, uh, Ed even talked about that today. You know, we think, everyone thinks it means no God. Right? No, it's just no comment. We keep it separate. Whatever we know. They've cut all of our time to like 50 minutes, and it's hard enough for a preacher to do an hour. So I'm really going to try, and this happens to be the speech that has the most slides ever, so I need to shut up and just show it. But we have this story of ignorance big time in our head. When I grew up, I thought, okay, Columbus came here. And maybe his kids or grandkids or so, maybe well, they were the pilgrims, they showed up. And then uh, maybe their grandkids, and, you know, Washington came in with the Terminator head on the needle. And, and it was just like, you know, what, it was probably 20, 30 years or so, maybe the past, you know, he had, I was just totally clueless. When we know the reality, it was 1492, Columbus came, 128 years passes before the pilgrims get here. And then another 156 years uh, to 1776. So that's a big part of history that gets skipped over in our uh, classrooms, and I think that's part of the problem. We don't understand it. And of course, as a regular kid growing up and going to a uh, public school, I thought when the guys got here, that's the way it was. You know, the pilgrims showed up, everybody loved each other, they had great religious peace, and that's what we celebrate today, being the great Christian nation that we are. Would somebody bring me some water, would you mind, please? Don't mind. Um, but that's not the case, obviously. I'll go through some of these quickly. Uh, 1565, Fort Carolina and Florida was destroyed by Pedro, came in by uh, order of King Philip, and they wiped out an entire fort because they were teaching the Lutheran doctrine, which you know was a hateful doctrine and, and that they wanted to spread. So it wasn't about religious freedom. Thank you, sir. I was going to do the whole scripture, if you give a drink of water in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet to <laughs> Um, John Winthrop, City on the Hill, you know, we're going back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. A lot of people don't know they weren't about religious freedom. They might have came to practice what they wanted to practice. But Roger Williams, the founder of, you might know, Rhode Island. He, he was guilty of uh, heresy for his diverse, new, and dangerous opinions. Anne Hutchinson, she was unfit for society because she challenged the church. Uh, they threatened the Jesuit priests that they would kill them, and four Quakers were executed between 1659 and 1661 just because they wouldn't follow their great, wonderful, peaceful religion. So that brings us uh, to mind, everybody knows the Danbury Baptist and where the separation church and state came from is the letter that um, Thomas Jefferson wrote to them. But what we don't pay attention to a lot of time is the actual letter he was responding to. And I, I've cut out just a couple of the things here. Basically, what was going on, um, you know, if you, they're saying, hey, we're glad you became president, 
uh, we're on we're on your side. You know, it's about religious liberty and, and you know the religious opinions and then, and the government of Connecticut had in it a lot of structures that controlled how the uh, the Baptists could function. They had, they were taxed and they had to pay taxes to uh, which ended up going to their church and so it was all this stuff and so it was about religious freedom and they really were worried about themselves and the freedom that we do have you know if we have the freedom of speech and the free religion then we're just getting it because they allow us to have it and what should we do with it and so it, it's a very complicated issue but it shows again my emphasis how religious people above all else should thank god that we're a second nation and it was these kind of things we were built on because our forefathers knew that uh, God changed his mind a couple times in history. Uh, and the church has always done this. They've gone through things to where they later say, oh, oh yeah, well, we just were ignorant of, of stuff. You know, like this is the original uh, view of how the earth was. Like we talked about that, uh, the sort of God says in the circle of the earth, there was the firmament of heaven, the windows of heaven that, you know, that's where the rain would come out and where you place the stars and you have Sheol and the pillars of the earth and, and all these things. So, and we know it's wrong, and I don't know of any church people who still believe that. Because, and then they use scripture to say, oh, well, we understand it now. James Usher, you know, of course, and October 23rd is on my calendar, actually. I send out emails and thank people helping his creation day. That's when the world was created, if you didn't know. And we know he was wrong, 4.5 billion years old. And there are some Christians, obviously, who deny that, but the mass majority do accept that to be true. Uh, Library of Alexandria. Uh, as a kid, being a Carl Sagan fan, the very first episode of Cosmos, he goes through and talks about how all these great sciences were created there and how they, um, it was such a great place and the church came in and destroyed it. And I remember being a kid, because I think Sagan actually says that it set back uh, technology like a thousand years or since we had to relearn everything. And I was a kid like, I should have my Jetsons car right now. I should be <laughs> on the moon. And I was so pissed at the church. Because of that stuff. <laughs> and, um, See Agora, if you haven't seen it yet, it's a great movie. It deals with what happened there. The um, Dark Ages. I, I know everyone's seen this on the internet. I don't know how accurate it is. It's probably not, but I think it does do a really good picture of what happened and the hole that was left from when we say Dark Ages. It means because the church was in control. And the uh, faith-based initiatives of the old days were all based on the Bible. Crusades. They use verses. They take up your cross. You, you, Jesus said, "I ain't come to bring peace with a sword." They were using all these verses, and then of course now they say, "Oh, but there's also the peace and love part." We've had, but a government that was controlled by the church didn't have the checks and balances of the secular nation, which I'll get into. You have the Crusades, the Inquisition, was the same way. There's tons of scriptures that were used to justify the Inquisition. Same with the trial of Galileo. There's a lot of church people now who try to pretend that wasn't even a religious thing. But if you read the trial, all these all these scriptures were used against him. And you know, the Catholic Church just apologized to him a couple years ago, I think, that they were wrong. Um, did he accept the apology? Uh, <laughs> if he did, then we're all in the wrong business, I think. <laughs> Bernie witches. It's, it's you're not supposed to let a witch live, you're supposed to kill him. We know that happened here as well. And so these are the products that our forefathers saw, the things that were happening, and mix it with a lot of things. Ed said his book's great, you can read it, and, and explain how they knew that having a secular government would protect us from kings and uh, uh, the religious ruling class. And again, I'm under the opinion, and, and what I'm suggesting here is that the church is different and has changed. And still a lot of BS, of course, but that they aren't the same church that they used to be, or even what they would be if we didn't have the secular government. Um, the whole now, like, oh, I'm not religious, I have a personal relationship with Jesus, so many people hear that all the time. And, you know, the whole peace and love and all this stuff, that was never around until secular governments were able to force that to happen. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, his lightning rod, it, it, I don't know how many of y'all know the story, but he invented the lightning rod, and he was criticized all across the colonies for doing so uh, because he was getting in the way of God's judgment, and there's all these letters talking about how evil he is. And it's pretty funny, actually, when you read it, but, of course, now we think, oh, <laughs> that wasn't really what God was doing. And we know the quotes, so I won't go through them all of Benjamin Franklin, the way the 
seen by faith is the shut the eye of reason, we found the Christian dogma unintelligible. All these things are things that could not be said in a society that was ruled by the church. George Washington, uh, same way, talking about the effectual barriers. And some of these people were deists, obviously, and I'm not trying to claim they're atheists, and I'm not even going to go into that. And a lot of them, let's even say some of them were Christian, but they weren't what we consider nowadays Christians to be. It's quite a, quite a bit different. They weren't evangelicals like we are now. Uh, one of my favorite stories about George Washington, you read from Thomas Jefferson, he was writing to someone. And think about politicians today. I mean, uh, some, uh, Dr. Rush told me that he had it from Asa Green that when the clergy addressed General Washington on his departure from government, it was observed their uh, consultation that he never on any occasion said a word to the public which showed a belief in the Christian religion. And they thought they should press him on this issue and basically, you know, are you a Christian or not? And uh, he still wouldn't answer it and had fun without telling them. But can you imagine that now if a, a politician would even dare to not say whether they believed in God or not. It's fascinating. John Adams, as we know, the, uh, has said many things. Uh, we, we attribute him to the Treaty of Tripoli, even though Jefferson was involved in that too, and it wasn't necessarily all his words. But that's where it comes from. If, if, if you know history, we were fighting with the treaty, what was going on in Tripoli. We had the Muslim countries are at the time in Tripoli. They were uh, taking all of our uh, ships and stealing all of the things. Because according to um, Islam and, and in the Quran, there's three things you do with non-believers. You can kill them, convert them, or tax them. And uh, that was kind of their views of things. They didn't see us as a real people. They were going to you know, take what they wanted from us. And so they were concerned when we were going to make the, the treaty. They were concerned that we were a Christian nation and that we would be against them. And so they wanted to make it clear that we're in no way a Christian nation. Funny enough, that's the exact same thing that Obama said in Turkey that got everyone so upset when it was the exact same thing to let the Muslim world know that we're not a Christian nation. But if you remember, people got really upset at him for this. It was no different than what John Adams said. Well, I'm going through these quickly. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Christianity neither is nor ever was a part of the common law. Erecting a statue of wall separation, we just talked about that, you know, of, of, of how important it was to these men. The Jefferson Bible, I have, this is actually a copy of the one I have that the Smithsonian put together, and it's actually photocopies of each page that he wrote, and it even has like where he had pieces taped into it, they taped in little pieces just like what he wrote. Where he went through the Bible, or he went through the Gospels, and he took out all the myths part, and the virgin birth, and the resurrection, he took all that and just had it be a moral code. What a lot of people don't know that a copy was given to every congressperson from 1904 to 1957 when they would go into office of the Jefferson Bible. Why did it stop in 1957? As we all know, that was during the big Red Scare. And this is where a lot of this stuff happened. We were afraid of the communists. And I remember even being a kid, I didn't know who atheists were. I just, only thing I would either hear of was just the godless communists. You know, I had no idea what was going on. But 1954 is when we changed the pledge, took under God out. Uh, our models changed in 56, and uh, the paper money in 1957. So it all happened around that same time. So, and, and that's the thing we need to do to educate people, to say, the Cold War is over, you know, we don't have to worry about this anymore. Let's restore unity in our country, and let's restore our money, and let's restore our pledge, and take that anger off it. I think can be very effective. Most people don't even know this, uh, especially with so what I do when I'm talking to church and I'm doing interfaith type stuff, I, I take the whole secular nation thing and, and I talk about how they're better now. And uh, the part in the Bible, St. Peter, is one of the places where God would be the, the potter that he puts us into the flame and, and he burns out the dross and removes the dross until he can see his reflection into it, which was the way that was the way you purify, you know, everything that can be shaken should be shaken. You know, make sure the, the, it's built on solid ground and all this stuff. And iron sharpens iron is the thing we used to use in seminary a lot, where we would challenge each other in our thinking. It was iron sharpening iron that you know we can improve our theology. And this is what I try to do when I'm talking to the church because they have benefited so tremendously because of our secular nation. Like slavery, no one, anyone who even pretends to say slavery is not endorsed in the Bible does not know the Bible at all. 
it's very clear is that it supports that you can treat people like property. Uh, you know, I love this one. When a man strikes a male or female slave with a rod so hard that the slave dies under his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, the slave survives for a day or two, he is not to be punished since the slave is his property. That's, that's just as much as John 3.16, you know. Even, even, even uh, Jesus was talking about it, uh, the slaves being beaten by their masters. Uh, I was debating one person one time, and the guy said that, well, it was just different words. Uh, it was really talking about more like an employee-employer relationship and all this stuff. And so I used the scripture, I believe it's in Exodus, where the, um, it says, if you go in and you're, you're raping and pillaging this town, and you see a woman who, or a young lady who you think is great, and you want to make her your wife, uh, you can take her, shave her head, let her sleep at the foot of your bed for four days and mourn the death of her father and be sad, and then you can take her as your own. That's a hell of an employee benefit package. <laughs> but slavery's in there, and that's the way it was. You go through the South, there's sermon after sermon of people using these scriptures to justify slavery. But as we know, but because we have a secular nation, people like Frederick Douglass were free to speak. And were able, because if it was just the church in charge and say a slavery is good enough for the Bible, he wouldn't have even been able to publish it. And, and uh, if you haven't read his autobiography, it's tremendous. Uh, he actually, in one of the later editions, he, they tried to change some of these words and, and make him more like, oh, I'm not saying the church was really bad. But he obviously was a great guy. Uh, same with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the, you know, the, for him to even challenge the things that he was able to challenge, again, I would say, if the church was in power, we wouldn't even have got to them. And something, you know, then what happens? Years later, they go, oops, oh yeah, we, we were wrong, because the Bible also says we're neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, and, and we didn't see that part before. And so the church adjusts and says, we ne God never was for slavery, we just didn't see that, and how much better we are. Well, it's that secular government that forced them to be able to see this. And just something that I think is awesome and amazing and something that as much as we, you know, we're worried about going into war and all these things right now, one of the great things that we have done, if you think about 50 years ago, this speech happened and that now a black president was able to do the next, I mean, that's an amazing accomplishment for 50 years. Uh, there's a long way to go, obviously. I'm not trying to say that racism isn't very real in the South, so I know it's true. Uh, but that's pretty amazing. And he's in the White House that was built by slaves. I mean, think of that. I mean, that is incredible. And that's, that's a great victory. And, and I don't think many countries can, can have a story like that. It's hard enough for someone who's the minority of the country to, to rise to power, even though it's happened a couple times. It's something that we should be very proud of and a, a great part of history. But anyway, same happened with women's rights. There was no doubt that women are supposed to be quiet. You're supposed to remain silent in the church. Wives are to submit to their husband. Uh, there's an old Orthodox prayer. You know, uh, I've actually heard this prayer in the Hebrew. Blessed art thou, O God, for not making me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And in the Quran, uh, the fourth uh, chapter there is very rough on women and talking about women being quiet. Even gives uh, uh, men the power to beat their wives and whatnot. So. Governments controlled by religion, like we see many in the, in the Middle East, these can still be the rules. But because we have the secular government, people like these great people were able to speak up and to defend our, uh, our rights. You know, I, I love the, um, the bottom one there with Susan B. Anthony talked about, which we say to outsiders, that a Christian has neither more nor less rights in our association than an atheist. When our platform makes it too narrow for people of all creeds and of no creeds, I myself shall not stand on it. But you get all the stuff, and she was so it's so ironic that on her dollar that it says in God we trust there. <laughs> but again, these people wouldn't have, we, if we didn't have this secular government, these kind of things wouldn't have been able to happen. And of course, then the church says, "Oops, oh yeah, because uh, the Bible says we're neither neither male nor female." Uh, that your daughter shall prophesy, and uh, he created them. Adam was a uh, means mankind, so it's male and, and so they change and they adapt because they were forced to. Yeah, 
war, we still don't have equal rights. Uh, of course. And the same thing is happening now, and I've been saying this for years, that obviously the Bible is against homosexuality. We all know that. And if you even look at, in Corinthians, it goes so far, if you actually read the proper definition, it says, no idolaters, no adulterers, nor effeminate. So not just being gay, if you just have a little bounce in your step as you walk, <laughs> you weren't good enough for the house of God. Uh, but what's going to happen, and it's already started happening, in 20 years, the majority of church, I'm telling you, are going to change, and they're going to start seeing and saying <laughs> that, oh, God's not against homosexuality, we were wrong all along, and what they do now, and I could go through each verse and tell you what they've done, but just to give you one, the one where it says, if a man lies with a, or if a man lies with men as he lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable, so they're basically saying, it's not a sin for gay guys to have homosexual sex. It's a sin for heterosexual people to have homosexual sex. <laughs> and this is what they are literally saying. They go through everything with the verse and even how David and Jonathan, their relationship, it's, 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 it's crazy. But I guarantee in 20 years, there's going to be all this going on and the church will say, oh, well, we've always been accepting of homosexuals. It's just we didn't understand the full meaning of Scripture. The biggest obstacle we face right now, in my opinion, is what I call the Church of Oprah. We've got this misunderstanding of religious tolerance and can't we all just get along? And, and even though that's a great idea and I, I support that, I, I've gone to some places and, and I know not all UU churches are this way, but one I went to in Atlanta to speak and you know I saw that there was same-sex couples there. I said, this is great, this is cool, maybe I'll bring my family here. But then they get up and say, on Wednesday night, we're having an astrology class, and on Thursday, we're talking about the secret, and stuff like that. <laughs> Some things are just bullshit. Sometimes there's not two sides to every coin. And so, I like that one better. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. But, and I think where our problem is, is we, we don't understand that there's a difference between being respectful of someone and respecting their beliefs. You are free to believe what you want. The Klan has the right to exist in America. They have a right to be as horrible and hateful and racist as they want to be. But when you take those things out into the common marketplace, it deserves just as much ridicule and just as much criticism as any other thought would. And I think we misunderstand that greatly. And a lot of us know it, but especially the people out there who, uh, the newer atheists and, and a lot of believers for the most part, you know, because the argument stops if somebody throws up the faith card. If I say I'm against stem cell research because it's my religious views, you have to say, okay, well, I respect that. Well, no, I can have that view, but when I bring it into the marketplace, it deserves to have it be verified or kicked out. If somebody told us the Holocaust never happened, we would tell them they are crazy. We'd walk on the other side of the street from them. We wouldn't want to be around them. But if someone says evolution didn't happen, it's okay, that's their religious views. But there's more evidence that the, that the evolution happened than even the Holocaust. And of course they both happened. But we have this false understanding of what it means to be respectful. And uh, that really has to change. JFK in his uh, big speech, to get to a little current time, you know, this was when everyone was worried that he was going to be the Catholic president. And he made it very clear, you know, that, he, that the Pope wouldn't have any influence on him. What are we doing on time here? Um, that he wouldn't have any influences and that he believes, you know, separation church state is absolute and all these things. And in the modern times of can we all just get along in the Church of Oprah, we get told other things. Rick Sonatorum, that's unfair to do a picture of him like that. <laughs> there you go, that's <laughs> He said that JFK's speech made him throw up. They talked about how horrible it was and all that. I mean, it's Disgusting. Same with Romney. Was it fair game for us to ask him about his Mormonism? Why shouldn't it be? Uh, up until, was it 1976, uh, black people weren't even able to become members of the church. And, you know, they talk about God cursed the skin of darkness and stuff. If he believes this, and I don't think he does, but if he says his life is guided by his religious views, shouldn't we be able to ask him these questions? Well, do you believe this? But we're always shut down as if we're supposed to be respectful about this stuff. And to not just beat up on the Republicans, uh, tell you something good, to have Barry Goldwater, if you remember him, and uh, he was telling John Dean, and John Dean wrote this down. 
This was his uh, last, last time, the modern conservative movement came from him. And uh, he said, mark my word, if and when these preachers get control of the Republican Party, and they're sure trying to do so, it's going to be a terrible damn problem. Frankly, these people frighten me. Politics and governing demand compromise, but these Christians believe that they are acting in the name of God, so they can't and won't compromise. I know I've tried to deal with them. And he's the modern of modern, or he is the founder of modern, modern conservatism. And no one could ever become a Republican nominee with thoughts like that today. In Big Bird Gate Part 2, if you guys remember when these guys were debating, it was both of them were asked about their Catholicism. And the person who asked the question was criticized greatly because you shouldn't be asking this, those questions. But they both said that it informs everything they do. And uh, I mean, it's funny because they can have totally opposite, opposite views but their belief system and the way they read the Bible can be totally different from one another. But if they say it defines who I am, don't you think then we can ask those questions and find out what's going on? I mean, think about it. Many evangelical Christians that are in the house right now believe this is a good thing that's going to happen. That the rapture is going to happen, Jesus come back, and all the planes are going to crash, and the wrecks, and the death, and they look for this as a good thing. Don't we need to know whether they believe this or not? Will that affect how they govern, maybe? The Mark of the Beast. This is a side thing I'm just throwing in because I love it, but it has nothing to do with my talk. <laughs> but, again, if the people believe this, and very few people probably do, I, I heard as a minister, if you go in uh, the way the book of Revelation is written, it's written in a lot of code and allegory because of, you know, it's supposed to be secret mission stuff. And if you take 666 and the words for it and stuff, it's, most modern biblical scholars, uh, scholars believe he was talking about Nero because that's you can spell Nero and you know they were talking about the Roman control. But anyway, that's a side of the thing. All right, some guy told me, or I was I was debating with him. He was talking about the Mark of the Beast and how there was three types of prominent languages at the time when they wrote this, and these were the symbols for six in each of those. And so what he was saying the Mark of the Beast was. <laughs> Don't be home without. Yeah, that's American Express. But isn't that awesome? I just think that's so hilarious. That I think that. And like I said, I just wanted to put it in there. All right. Think about it. the second coming. Pretty big deal. If someone's in the White House and they think this is how the world's going to end, and maybe by pressing a button they can bring Jesus back quicker, shouldn't we be concerned about that? Again, they're free to believe what they want. But if you're going to take a position of power, we need to know, what do you think about Israel? What do you think about the Middle East right now? What is your position on these things? And they can't say, well, my faith doesn't, doesn't matter. We're talking about practical stuff. Uh, I'll leave with a quote from Sagan. How is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought. The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead, they say, no, 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 my God is a little God, and I want him to stay that way. A religion old or new that stresses the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional face. And that's the message I usually present when I go and speak at churches and stuff. So I will be done for now and take Q&A. We only have time for about one or two questions. Speaking uh, tonight with Chuck for about 20 minutes or so, and if I can probably do some Q&A then too, or afterwards, come find me. I know we're rushed for time. So. Okay, Brother Richard, uh, my question to you is, uh, you, throughout uh, your presentation, you showed instances of where a secular government kind of forced the religions to re-examine their values right. and such. Do you really think they think of it as a good thing? I've run into many... Uh, shall we say, fundamentalists who would rather have it back that old way, given the old time religion. Well, depending given on how slavery. far, I don't think many of them want to return to slavery, and I don't think many women want to go back to Proverbs 31 and be that kind of woman. Um, so yes and no, some they don't like, but that's why I'm trying to change the mindset to say, yes, but it, it, it purifies your faith, the iron sharpening iron. That is, it's, it's a way that by when you're being challenged, if something is shaken, 
the Bible says it's a good thing. It should be shaken and it should fall down so that you built your house on solid ground. Next. Next. Anybody got a pain in their arm that you're praying for or anything? <laughs> Yes, we should throw our visas up on the stage. Oh, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Josiah. I have a question about uh, how much I'm supposed to care about what other people believe. Most, almost everyone just wants to do work, go to work, take care of their kids, buy a better stereo. Right. And if they're a good person, but they believe in Jesus, but they don't do anything with that belief, why do I care? And if they're some sort of bigot or felon, and then they say it's because of Jesus? Again, why do I care it's Jesus they're found? I agree. And, but that's not the people we deal with, especially in the South. Um, it's, it's quite a bit different. And it's, it, the, the unfortunate thing is they don't keep it, quite a few Christians don't keep it to themselves. They think it's their job to change government, to infiltrate school boards is how they started when the Christian coalition started. If you read the way they did it, they got the school boards, and then they went to a little small, you know, run from the dog catcher, all that things to infiltrate, you know, I mean, like praying school. You can pray in school if you want to pray. The government can't control it. But there's religious people that want to force my kid to pray in school. And that's when it matters. And the and, and end times stuff, I mean, that's a, that's a serious thing. If Bush really believed in the end times and the whole Gog and Magog story, if y'all heard it, that's pretty scary. And it could have influenced him, maybe not. I like to think that when you get that point of power, you're, you're intelligent enough not to let something like that happen. You do know, possibly. And that does affect. Anyone else? Going once? Going twice? Thank you all very much. <laughs>